this week we're um, discussing two stories that have so much in common that I've ended up combining them into one week's lesson. And that is the infirm woman and Peter's mother-in-law. And they were both healed on the Sabbath. So we're going to explore the significance of Jesus healing these two women on the Sabbath day. So let's um, first talk about this idea of having a Sabbath day. So when the Israelites were freed from bondage of slavery, they were commanded to um, keep the Sabbath day. Now, this would have been a very foreign concept for them. As slaves, there was no such thing as weekends. There was no such thing as a day off. So being told to rest from their labors would have just been like, what? What, what does that even look like? What is that? So when you read in Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11, you read about this commandment that we are to keep it holy. On the six days, you do all your work. But on the seventh day, you don't do any of the work. And no one else does any of their work. And, and basically modeling it after the pattern of Christ or of Jesus and Heavenly Father when they created the earth. So, um, so again, just if it, it's kind of hard because we're so used to a Sabbath day, we're so used to weekends, but just imagine after 400 years of slavery, how foreign this idea would have felt to them that you couldn't do work on one day a week and what work was it and what did that look like? Well, in an effort to keep this commandment, um, the Pharisees created what was known as fence laws or extra laws. So if you don't, if you keep these extra laws, then you don't run any risk of breaking the Sabbath or, you know, not keeping the Sabbath day holy. So these extra laws were designed to keep you and protect you. So you didn't, do anything that would make you break the Sabbath day. So if you look in various places in the scriptures, you'll find different allusions to what the work actually looked like. And there's references to baking, sewing, writing, and building. And I find it interesting because if you think about the Tabernacle of Moses, these four activities can all be connected to the Tabernacle of Moses. So baking, there was showbread that was in the in the um, the inner part of the temple where the incense was burned. There was the sewing. That's how the high priests were clothed. They had to be sewn, and they were you know put had garments placed on them. There was writing. The commandments were written on stone tablet and put in the holy of holies. And then there was the building. So the tabernacle was transportable. It was um, something that would get broken down and, and moved and built back up again. So anything involving that would be forbidden as well. And what I find interesting as I think about this, what's the one way that we as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints all collectively keep the Sabbath day holy exactly the same. What's one thing that the entire church, no matter what country you're in, no matter, you know, where you are, we all have agreed to keep the Sabbath day holy in, in at least one regard. And that is we don't do temple work. Temples are closed on Sundays all around the world. That's something that we all participate in as far as resting from our labors is temple work. I just, anyway, I find that interesting. Okay, now we get into what's known as the Mishnah. And there's really nothing in our religion that's like a Mishnah, but the closest thing I can think of would be like our handbook or a guidebook maybe, in that it tells us what we can and can't do for girls camp or board activities or you got to set up a temple family history committee and, you know, those kinds of things. Those aren't necessarily commandments, but they're more like, here's a guide to help us live our commandments. And so that's what the mission is like, I would say, is it's a bunch of um, guidance, rules, different things that make it so that you can keep your commandment of keeping Sabbath day holy and a whole bunch of other things too. It's not just this. So there's 39 different categories in the Mishnah when it comes to keeping the Sabbath day holy. In other words, there's 39 things that they have 
categorized under those four things, the baking, the sewing, the writing, and the construction. So if you look through this list, um, we have plowing, planting, harvesting, gathering, threshing, you know, so think of, okay, so we can't bake, right? What is involved in baking? Well, you got to plant the seeds, you got to reap the reap what you sow, you got to grind. So if you see in the Mishnah, you have all the different activities connected to baking one loaf of bread. And the same that goes with making clothing. What do you got to do to make clothing? Well, you got to skin animals, you got to weave, you got to, you know, pierce fabric, you've got to tie things, untie things. So all of those are banned, gluing, taping, stapling. And then you think about writing and erasing and, and, um, and with, uh, you know, you can't, you, you can't extinguish a flame, you can't light a flame. So what I want you to do is you look at this long list of all the different activities, I want you to kind of brainstorm and get creative and think, okay, in, in today's world, what are things that would be forbidden under the Mishnah in, in today's world? And just to give you a hint, um, electricity is considered fire. So you can't turn on or off electricity. So I want you to just pause this video and ask yourself and, if, and then put it in the after class quiz. What are some things that you think would be forbidden as far as keeping the Sabbath day holy according to the Mishnah and according to falling under the categories of baking, sewing, writing, and construction. Okay, so pause. All right, so what I'm gonna do is, this is by no means an exhaustive list, but I'm gonna show you a few that exist today. And, um, and just keep in mind that even though the Mishnah has 39 categories, in, in our world today, the Jews have hundreds of categories of lists of things that you can't do on the Sabbath. And, and it's been modernized and adapted to today's world. So here's just a tiny, not even a tip of the iceberg. This is like a drop in the bucket of, of some things. You can't press a button to use an elevator. So um, when I lived in New York City, I was always warned, don't get in a Shabbat elevator because the doors never close and they stop at every floor. And then that way you can get into the elevator, get to where you need to go, and you never had to push a button. You can't rip toilet paper, no tearing. And so you can buy um, toilet paper where each square has individually been ripped already so that when you use the bathroom, you have toilet paper you don't have to rip. You can't turn on any lights. Um, you can't erase anything. You can't climb a tree because you don't want to break any twigs. You don't want to break any leaves. So you can't, and, and in some cases you can't walk on grass because you might accidentally break a blade of grass. Can't use any cell phones, any mobile devices. So you have one day a week where you completely unplug. So can you see maybe how there's some benefits, you know, to the Mishnah and to all these rules? But my guess is, um, well, I'll get to that in a second, but I also want you to think about cooking. And this goes into significance with Peter's mother-in-law. But so here are just a tiny little portion of the rules. Can't heat anything above 120 degrees in order to make it edible. So, you know, like eggs or something where it's got to be heated in order for you to be able to eat it. Can't make hard food soft or soft food hard. But you can put food on a heat source on Friday afternoon before Shabbat starts. It can heat that food throughout Shabbat, and then on Sunday you can turn it off. So I went on Amazon and I found this thing called a warming tray. It's $120, and it's specifically designed for Shabbat. And you can place your food on this warming tray, and it will just slowly keep that food warm. So you can have warm food on Saturday, and then you can turn it off on Sunday. They actually had this at the time of Jesus, not something you could buy on Amazon, obviously, but they had these um, clay warmers that you would put on the stove and it would retain enough heat that you could keep your food warm throughout Shabbat. So even that concept was going around during the time of Jesus. Okay, so you might be thinking at this point, oh my gosh, I'm so glad I'm not Jewish. I couldn't do that. There are so many rules. Um, and I, and I just want you to know, I'm not giving you all this information to disparage or make fun of the Jews, but to help you see just what, how extensive those fence laws can become. 
But also, I want to point out that in our religion, we have fence laws too. We have laws that aren't necessarily breaking like God's commandment, but they're things to help you so that you don't break God's commandment. So think about like, I think um, I, I don't have youth anymore, so I'm not super familiar with strength of youth pamphlet, but I understand there's been some changes concerning tattoos and piercings and dating before the age of 16, where they're kind of getting rid of some of those fence laws to help them understand the true spirit of chastity and what that looks like. Um, and so you can kind of see the difference of a fence law versus a commandment um, when you look at the strength for youth pamphlet changes. Now, as you can imagine, if you live in a community where most people are practicing the same religion as you, like New York City, there's high concentration of Jews, it's much easier to keep these fence laws because the society, the community is built around those fence laws. So you imagine like here in Utah, we have a lot of stores closed on the Sabbath because we um, traditionally, as a religion, don't make purchases on the Sabbath. We consider that to be labor. Um, and, but it's easier to be in a community that supports that um, when everyone's, for the most part, is practicing that same religion. So I, I just want you aware that you probably have more fence laws in your life than you realize. But if you are in a community with a high concentration of LDS members, you probably don't even notice them because you're all just doing them together. And so I'm not here to actually make fun of or, or talk bad about fence laws, but I just want you aware of what they are and what they look like and how they differ from actual commandments. Okay, now let's get into um, where Jesus healed uh Peter's mother-in-law. So this was in the town of Capernaum, and we've talked about Capernaum, you know, already quite a bit. So just as a reminder, it's on the coast of the Sea of Galilee. It's a fishing town. Um, this is where Peter's family lived, and this was like a second home to Jesus. So a lot of miracles happened in Capernaum, and, um, and we see Jesus showing up in Capernaum quite a bit, and, you know, and it makes sense that Peter lives in Capernaum. He's a disciple to Christ. And um, anyway, so that's that's Capernaum. That's the town. Now let's look at households. So this is one of the few things that we have where we know exactly where Peter lived and we know exactly the home that he lived in because archaeologists have found it. So um, this picture is a 3D mock-up of Peter's um, archaeological home. And as you can see, it's actually multiple homes sandwiched together, circling a courtyard. So all the doors of the homes enter into this main courtyard. And that makes sense with what we've learned about when a woman marries a man, they move into the home of the father in that the son builds a home annexed to the father's home. So it kind of makes a little more sense when Christ says, I ascend into my father to prepare a mansion for you. You know, it's that same kind of a concept that wouldn't have been a foreign idea to the people he said that to at the time. And so as you can see, it grows with an extended family. So you get siblings, cousins, aunts, uncles, grandparents. So Andrew, Peter's brother lived in this home and, um, and the oldest male of the family was the head of the household. Now, what's interesting is family members were taken care of through the male bloodline. So the wife went with the husband and was cared, or, you know, and was cared that way. So the fact that Peter is caring for his wife's mother would have actually been quite rare at the time. So why, I don't know, it's not in the scriptures, but she must not have had a husband to take care of her. Maybe she didn't have any sons who could take care of her. So it's it's very unique that Peter has taken his mother-in-law into his home. And I think it says something about Peter to find that Peter's mother-in-law is living with them. Okay. Now, um, let's talk a little bit about what it meant to be infirm or to be crippled or, you know, to have a disability during the time of Jesus. 
So if somebody had an infirmity, that was they were considered by the society to be in disfavor from God. So some you've done something to make God not look favorably down upon you, and that's why you're suffering. That's why you're crippled. And um and you know, if you look in John chapter 9 verses 1 through 12, you see kind of this disagreement or this question of well, if somebody's blind, who messed up? Did the blind person mess up or did the parents mess up, you know? And so God teaches a whole new concept. But but the general consensus or belief was if you're something's wrong with you, you've done something wrong. Okay. So now let's look a little more into the story of the infirm woman and look at what she did. So we know from scripture she had been suffering for 18 years. And my guess is, and for those of you with chronic illnesses and, and situations, you can probably attest to this, that you also suffer emotionally and spiritually, not just physically when you have a disability. It, it can make you question things and it can challenge your faith and also your mental health. Um, so she quite possibly was looked down upon both literally and figuratively as having done something wrong or there was something wrong with her. And yet we know from the scriptures that she attended synagogue. I find this so inspirational and so humbling that not only are women not commanded to attend synagogue, but like we learned, they can't even speak. They can't sit with the men. They have to sit somewhere else. And yet 18 years of crippling, she's coming to the synagogue. And um, so let's look at what Jesus did as this woman's walking in. And we don't really have evidence that she came to be healed by Jesus, but just that she was merely going to synagogue. So um, Jesus sees her, calls her over. And I'm just trying to imagine that moment when you, you've been suffering for 18 years, you just go to synagogue to go, and the Messiah calls you over to him. And he says, woman, you are freed from your disability, which makes me think of bondage. She's been in bondage this whole time, and he's freeing her from that bondage. And then he does something that we know would have been so radical. He laid his hands on her and immediately she's made straight and immediately she's glorifying God. She knows exactly who has healed her. So just to recap, Jesus touches the woman. He's healing on the Sabbath, which is one of the activities you can't do of the many. You can't heal. He calls the ruler of the synagogues a hypocrite, doesn't call the woman a hypocrite. What he calls the woman is a daughter of Abraham. And I love this idea of calling her a daughter of Abraham because he was considered and still is to be the greatest patriarch. And so I don't know if you've heard of the um, organization called Daughters of Abraham, but it's where Jews, Muslims, and Christians come together to worship, not worship, but like learn from each other, study scriptures together, and focus on what they have in common. And so what he's doing, in essence, in my mind, by calling her Daughter of Abraham is unifying her and bringing her into this family and bringing her in and saying, you are just as worthy to be a daughter of the greatest patriarch who has ever lived as any one of us. You too are a daughter of Abraham. And then, as we know, he has freed her. He says, I'm going to free you. I'm going to free you from the bondage that has been holding you back. Imagine all the things she hasn't been able to do because she has been crippled for 18 years. <laughs> So now let's jump over to when he healed Peter's mother-in-law on the Sabbath. So let's, let's do a little bit of a background. Let's see where Jesus is at this moment. So if you look in Luke chapter 4, verses 1 through 30, we find Jesus has been tempted by Satan. 
He reads Isaiah in his, in his own synagogue, the Nazareth synagogue, his hometown, and openly declares himself to be the Messiah. He reads that part that talks about what the Messiah is coming to do. And, he, and it, it's the verse that talks about freeing people and helping people who are broken. And he basically says, that's me. I am that person. I am going to free people. I am going to heal people. Not taken well. They tried to push him off a cliff. He's run out of town. And where does he go? He goes to Capernaum. And I think that makes sense. If it feels like his second town and it's like a second home to him, it makes sense. That's where he went. He then goes to the synagogue in, in Capernaum at a, you know, a later day and he casts a devil out of a possessed man in, in a synagogue. On that same day that he cast that devil out of that possessed man, that's when he goes to Peter's home. And that's where Peter's mother-in-law is very ill. And he stands over her, rebukes the fever, and it immediately leaves her. And um, Peter's mother-in-law is immediately healed. So she rises up and instantly, being healed of this fever, of whatever illness she had, starts to minister. What does she do? She makes dinner. She's cooking. So think of all the rules she's now breaking, right? All these fence laws that she's breaking to, quote, work on the Sabbath and to have Jesus and these disciples fed. And um, and because of this amazing miracle and because of what Peter's mother-in-law is doing as a result of being healed, word gets out. And um, a crowd starts to gather right on the edge of this courtyard that that where Peter and the homes are circled about in this courtyard. So imagine that large group of people are starting to come and they come just as the sun is setting. So they're waiting for Shabbat to be over because you can't heal on the Sabbath, right? And so they're coming with their sick and diseases and all these different ailments saying, come and heal me too. And um, so just as the Sabbath is ending, just as the sun is setting, here's this courtyard full of people seeking to be healed, just like Peter's mother-in-law had been. So again, <clears throat> let's look. Touching a woman, right? He, he, we see this over and over, breaking that cultural norm. Again, healing on the Sabbath, doing something you can't do on the Sabbath. And here's what I love about this story and that I just find if, if there's, oh, how amazing would that be to be in Capernaum watching the sunset over the sea, seeing all these people gathering with their sick and they're dying and they're crippled and they're diseased, hoping to be healed by the man who has healed Peter's mother-in-law. And what does he do? He heals them individually. And I think with such a large crowd, he could just wave his hand and say, you are all healed, go home, you know, but he doesn't. He heals every single one, one by one. And, and I just think, think of all the stories we don't know because those people aren't in the scriptures, right? We don't know how their lives were changed and were impacted because they felt the master's touch. And, um, and what I also find so um, humbling and inspiring about this story is he's been so rejected. He's been kicked out of his own town. Satan has been tempting him. He's dealing with a lot. And yet he takes the time to heal one by one, despite what's going on in his own life at the time. What a powerful example for us. Okay, so I'm going to move my face a little bit. So in the after class quiz, there's some things I want you to think about. And just if you were going to be in a breakout room, how would you answer it? What would you say? Um, and one is, how can we be like Jesus? and bless others, not just on the Sabbath, but every day. How can we follow Jesus's example in these two stories and also be a blessing to others? 
And then as you think about the Sabbath and you think about fence laws and you think about the Mishnah and all that stuff, have you ever stopped to think whether your understanding of the Sabbath day needs to change? Um, are you putting restrictions on yourself that maybe is driving the spirit away instead of bringing the spirit in? Or are you doing the opposite? Are you um, maybe not being mindful of things that take away the holiness of the day? And maybe those are some things you need to change. But I really want this to be reflective and not accusatory of, well, other people do this and other people do that. But really bring it into yourself. What, where are you at with the Sabbath day? And, and, and kind of take your temperature. And do you need a paradigm shift? And I think we do throughout our lives at different times. We need to kind of readjust and rethink um, what it means to keep certain commandments. And then um, how can we think of others when we ourselves are suffering? And I just want to be clear. I don't mean acutely suffering. So like if you're bleeding on the sidewalk, that's not when you be like, oh, who should I be taking care of? Who should I be helping? I'm just talking about those chronic long term, we all are going through it. We all have things in our lives that because we're mortal, that make life hard. And it's easy to focus in on ourselves and focus in on, you know, that woe is me kind of a thing, very justifiably, right? But how can we, like Jesus, turn outward and, and, and lose ourselves and, um, and find ourselves through the service of others. And I think it's hard. I think it's a very difficult thing mentally to be thinking of others when we have so many needs ourselves. So what are some ways that we can do that to turn outward like Jesus did? Okay, I hope you have a great week.